Let's uh, open up our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Let's, re- let's open up our Bibles, and uh, we'll take turns and read this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Let's take turns and read this. Um, I'll read the odds, and you'll read the evens. I'll read this in ESV, my part, and uh, you'll read the even-numbered verses with whatever the version you may have. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is, a, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Verse 2. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure sufferings, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you with fear and trembling once again. Would you just come and captivate us, each one of us here tonight? Would you just capture our hearts that we may be able to uh, wake up to you, wake up to the reality, wake up to the tribulation that's coming. Father, I do ask that you would strengthen each one of us here tonight. As your words are being communicated to your people, would you eliminate eliminate the truth to us? Would you you, um, just cover us up with the blood of Jesus Christ that your son has shed on that cross on that day? Father, would you just uh, just come and anoint us with your Holy Spirit that we may be able to hear the truth and nothing but the truth. At this time, entrust all these things into your hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Starting last night, we've been talking about um, how we should prepare the kingdom uh, of God um, through... The five sessions that we're having, uh, we're talking about the glory, which was last night's session, the journey, this morning's session, the calling, which is tonight's session. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about uh, the song, the song, right? And the number five, tomorrow night, we're going to talk about the remaining time. These are the things that we're, gonna, we're talking about right now. And last night, we started with the glory. What is the reason why we should live another day? Uh, whether you're out there in the mission field or whether you're, you're here in America living, you know, as a, just a Christian, there is only one thing that we're living for. There's a common factor. Everybody lives for this if you're a Christian. In fact, everybody's created for this, but not everybody's living for this right now. However, if you're a Christian, you're trying to come before um, what the will of the Lord is, and you're trying to discern what is God's desire for me to live my life for. And yet last night, we talked about the glory of God. When you really behold the glory of God, and that should change your life. And when you begin to live for the glory of God, you'll begin to join the journey with Jesus Christ. And that journey will take us to the ends of the earth. And uh, this afternoon, this morning, we talked about that journey. In that journey, there's going to be persecutions, there's afflictions, there's imprisonments that are waiting for us. But in order for us to really finish up the journey, uh, this morning we talked about, in order to really finish up the journey successfully and being able to achieve the goal that God has entrusted to us, we have to begin to, we have to become a man and a woman of one thing, and that is to have that oneness with, with God. Not divided hearts, but you're just serving the Lord and only Him. So tonight we're going to talk about um, what does that look like? What does it mean to... Um, to to be a man and a woman of one thing in this day and age. And that's our calling. And how should we 
fight the good fight, in other words. How should we fight the good fight that's been entrusted to us in each day of our Christian lives in the world that we live in right now? So today we're going to talk about three things. Tonight we're going to talk about three things uh, that this passage communicates to us. Number one, we're going to talk about the world. What is the world that we live in? How is the world changing the world? Number two, the Christian, me. How am I supposed to live in this world? Number three, the crown. The fate of all the Christians who fight the good fight, who run the race, who finish up the course, and who keeps their faith. Who keeps their faith. What happens to us? So the world, the Christian, and the crown. When I sometimes come up with this kind of title, I'm actually proud of myself. Oh, this is like a very good title of a sermon. But that's what we're going to examine tonight. Three things. Number one. Let's examine um, the world. Let me read verse 3 and 4 one more time. Jesus warns us, this is exactly how the world's, world's going to change. Number Verse 3 and 4. Uh, actually, I honestly want to examine more in depth of verse 1 and 2, but we're just, we're just going to have to examine, focus on these three things for the sake of time, because tonight I actually want to talk about a little bit more about myself too, because, you know, I believe uh, there's going to be a you know, long way that we have to travel together. There's going to be a lot of good things that that, that may come out of uh, come out out of us, so um, so I, I want you to know where I am from and what I've been, what I've gone through, and uh, you, I want you to know something about me, so we can actually have that relation of trust, so we can reach the ends of the earth together. So today we're just going to talk about three things. I wish we could have more time to talk about more things, but today we're going to zoom in and actually talk about three things, three truths. Number one, uh, the world. Uh, Let me read verse three and four. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That's exactly what... um, Paul, Apostle Paul, is saying to his disciple, Timothy, this is how the world's going to change. What is the world that we're living in? How, how is the world that we're living in right now? And if you really don't wake up to it, you don't really see what's really going on around us, isn't it? Sometimes we are just too busy with our own lives. We're too occupied with our own, own, own lives. We don't see the big picture. We miss out on the big picture of what's going on. And when you realize in actuality, what's really going on, maybe it's too late. So maybe God, it's, it's a great chance that God has given us, you know, for us to wake up to the reality and see what's really going on and prepare ourselves to fit the reality. You see, um, one thing that I did learn in military school is this. If you know your enemy and if you know yourself, you will be able to win every single battle that you may face in this world. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to communicate here. This is the world. And this is you. And yeah, I want you to know about the world. I don't want you to be completely ignorant about the world, but I want you to know the world. This is how the world's going to change. Now you discern and you sanctify yourself. Now you set set yourself apart from that kind of world so you may be able to present yourself without spot and without blemish before the Lord as a holy bride of Jesus Christ. So, the world, there are three things he talks about. Number one, please repeat after me. The world will not endure sound teachings. The first thing that uh, Apostle Paul warns Timothy about is this. There, there's a time coming. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teachings. When we talk about enduring sound teachings, you know, when we talk about when people are not enduring sound teachings, we're not talking about people, you know, begin to refuse sound teachings. For example, if you share about Jesus Christ or if you share about the sound, solid teaching, the teaching of the Bible, when you start sharing about that, it's not like people are like, oh, it's okay, I'm not going to take it, I'm not going to listen to it. I'm not talking about that kind of passive refusal. What it means here, the word that's actually used here, the original word, People will not endure sound teaching. It means, it means something like this. It means people can't stand it. As if some kind of medication goes into your body and it has side effects. You start puking, throwing up, vomiting, and you're sweating. You're rolling on the floor because your body doesn't take it anymore. That's, that's exactly the word. That's exactly the nuance that's used here. There will come a day when people hear the truth, when people will hear the word of God, they can't stand the truth. They can't bear it. Because their body is no longer made for it. 
I'm thankful. I'm very thankful for you guys. But I'm actually I'm getting getting ready for a warfare <laughs> this upcoming uh, January. I'm actually going to be serving the Korean youth for a month. It's pretty bad. And uh, for those of you that have traveled to Korea recently, um, you'll know what I, you, you know what I mean. So if you actually go to uh, the Korean youth camp, the situation is pretty bad. So I really compliment you. I really want to commend you for who you are right now. You're worshiping passionately for God. So I say there's a lot of hope in the Korean diaspora youth. And uh, yeah, the, the important word is diaspora right there, uh, myself included. <coughs> but if you go to Korea, like for example, I usually serve in like many camps, many youth camps. And actually one of them actually has about 2,000 students coming and attending in each camp. So let, let's say for example, I go to a youth camp and there's about 2,000 students sitting there. And um, a preacher comes up and if he shares about you know, his life experience, if he shows a lot of like audio visuals and a lot of uh, like videos and stuff like that, people are actually, you know, people actually get into it. The youth group students are, oh my goodness, this is really fun. Well, when the preacher actually starts talking about the Bible and unpacking the truth and communicating the truth, the, the, the cross of Jesus Christ to the kids, guess what the kids are doing? start playing with their phones, kicking each other, elbowing each other. You know, people hold their hands and they go to the bathroom together. I don't know why people go to the bathroom together. <laughs> Girls, why do you go to the bathroom together? That's one mystery that I will be able to find out when I see Jesus Christ face to face. Jesus, why does people go to the bathroom together? <laughs> Especially in youth group camps. You know, there will come a day that people will not endure sound teachings. How about you? What are you interested in? Are you interested in the flowery, the, the luxurious aspect of Christian, so the Christian, um, I guess, culture? Or are you simply interested in knowing God? I want to have more of him. It might not be as um, fancy. It might not be as fun. But the book of Hosea says, come, let us come and know the Lord. God desires to be known by us. Number two, how is the world changing? Number two, it says, please repeat after me, the world will become self-centered. The number one was the world will uh, not endure sound teachings. Number two, how is the world going to change? It says, the time is coming. The world will not endure. Uh, the world will not, uh, the, the world will become self-centered because it says here, they will not endure sound teachings, but having each year, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. In other words, they will start listening to those sermons, somehow that fits them. They'll begin to follow those teachers and teachings that somehow they feel encouraged and they feel good about it. That's exactly what's going on throughout the world, isn't it? If you, if you go to a Christian conference, you know, I attend a lot of Christian conferences and I listen to other people's sermons too. And uh, I, I think in this day and age, probably the most I guess, you know, the most um, popular teaching is this, you can do it. And when people hear that, it's like, oh, I can do it? Yes, I can. I'm going to try really hard. You know, people really get excited over that kind of message. But when people actually hear the message of God saying, you know what, there's going to be tribulation, not peace. So now it's not going to be a peaceful time ahead of you, but it's going to be more tribulation coming on your way. So prepare for those times. People don't want to hear that. But I'm going to ask you now, if that somehow the message fits you well, you say, oh, it's a great preaching. If the worship somehow fits you well, you say, oh, it's a great worship. Well, if the church works out for you, you say, oh, it's a great church. But I'm going to ask you this. Since when have, have we become the standard to, me standard to measure what's good and what's, what's wrong? Since when have we become the measuring rod to discern what is good and what is not right? The Bible never has us as a standard, God, the Bible never has us as a measuring rod. Who's the only person who is the only, what, what, what is the only measuring rod according to the Bible to discern what is good and what is wrong? The great I am. If God likes it, that's a great worship. If God likes it, it's a great preaching. If God desires it, it's a great church. But who am I to say, oh, it doesn't fit me, so it, just, it doesn't work out for me. I don't like it. You know, it's not for me. You know, that's not a good worship. It's not a good, it's not a good sermon. Who are you to say that? How come the people's egocentric 
selfishness has sneaked into the church, everybody says what? Me, 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 bless me, bless me, understand me, sympathize me, you know, bless me now, understand me, hear me out. I'm going to tell you right now, human rights has corrupted the church. But this is not the place where the human rights becomes the ultimate founding, founding stone of, the, of, of a gathering. But this is, so, this is one location in the world where God reigns and God's, God's glory becomes the founding stone of our community. In other words, if you don't like it, if God likes it, so be it. Number three. Please repeat after me. The world will wander off into myths. When we talk about myths, people say, oh, are we talking about the Greek mythology? I'm not talking about that. If you look at the original terminology here, the myths, people, people will accumulate for themselves, the teachers, to suit their own passions. They want to hear what they want to hear, not the, wor not the words that God wants to just communicate to his people. So people want to talk about themselves. They want to benefit from, you know, they want to benefit from it. They, they're not really interested in what God's thinking about the church. They're not really thinking about what God's thinking about the Christians. Many times we are up for accomplishing, uh, accomplishing our agendas, our own agendas, instead of really thinking about what God's plan is for the rest of the world. So if you want to really join God's plan, God's going to start opening up for you what he really feels about the world. But many times we choose to hear what we want to hear. But number three, it says, people will begin to wander off into myths. But what does it mean by myths? I'm not talking about mythology here. If you look at the original word for myth here um, in, in, this, in this passage, it means something like this. Something that looks like the truth, very, very alike, but it's actually not the truth. It's a replica of the truth, but it doesn't have the essence of the truth. You know, people actually hold on to that as if this is their real salvation because they don't have any discernment. They have already left the truth. They have already turned their back against the truth. And they have already become so absorbed in their own passions and what they want to accomplish in their lives and what they want to hear and what they want to, uh, you know, accomplish in their lives. Since they're already so absorbed in that, they have already shut down the truth. And therefore, they're really not interested in the kingdom of God. So anything that looks like the truth has a form of the truth. Since they're not really interested in the, in the actual es essence of the truth, guess what? They get deceived. They, they think, oh my goodness, this is truth. This is a salvation. This is the gospel. This is, a, this is what it means to be a Christian. They go, entire, they go through their entire life. And on the last day, when Jesus says, let me see the salvation. Let me see your faith. And you show him, this is my faith, Jesus. And Jesus sees it. And what if he says this? fake what happens but it's a it's a tragedy so many people go through their entire life thinking that they're saved when they're really not it's a tragedy so many people think they have the truth when they actually have the replica of the truth without without having the essence of the truth let me give you, let me give you an example same example that i gave you earlier if you go to youth group camps, kids get really excited when you share this kind of message. You can do it! And the youth group students say, oh my goodness, I can do it. Yes, I can. I'm going to try really, really hard. But I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to ask you this. When does the Bible ever tell us that we can do it? Does, does the Bible ever talk about it? The Bible always says, you cannot do it. Where? It, it says, all have sinned and turned aside all have become worthless. No one is good, not even one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have fall from the short of all have fall from the uh, for, all have fall short from the glory of God. No matter how hard you try, you can't achieve the goodness that you you you're gonna ever you're you you're longing for. But through the redemption of Christ Jesus, we have been reckoned righteous, the righteousness of God. What does that mean? The Bible says, you cannot do it. No matter how hard you try, you cannot live the godly life you've been always thinking of. No matter how hard you try, you, you will never be able to achieve the Christian life that you're always longing for. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, however, behold the one who is the author and the perfecter of your faith. What does the Bible say? 
Behold the Lamb who is slain for our sake, who carries the sins of this world. What does the Bible say? The Son of Man has to be lifted up as a bronze serpent has been lifted up in the, in the wilderness. But whoever believes and beholds that Son of Man will be saved. What do you see? When you see Jesus Christ lifted up, when you see Jesus Christ lifted up, when you behold the lamb that is about to be slain for our sake, when you see the author and the perfecter of our faith, what do you see that changes us? What do you see? You see the beauty of God. You become crazy. You become crazy. You're just so absorbed in it. And you, you start pursuing after God's glory. That's how you change. You don't change by trying really hard. You don't, you don't accomplish your Christian life by trying so hard. It never happens. You don't discipline yourself to become a good Christian in the godliness. What happens is the founding, founding force in your entire Christian life has to be the beauty of Christ. You know, um, I um, think certain people are actually pretty crazy. And, uh, but I think... From the bottom of my heart, I do respect them. Artists. They have long hair. Um, they smoke a lot. I'm, I'm sorry for stereotype typing, but you know, these are the artists that I know. And usually they're really poor and they eat like grilled grilled cheese every day, you know, three times a day. And, and then they're so skinny because they are they're underfed and you know they smoke a lot and they have long hair. I don't know when they wash their hair and like it's a, probably been a long time since they actually took a shower and you know they probably don't shave. But you know what? They're they're even outcasts from the family. Their parents are not proud of them. You know what though? One thing that I do really admire about them, they are actually in pursuit, risking everything that they have. But they're pretty, pretty much placing their entire life on the line for the beauty that they have found in their life. The object of beauty. They want to they have that. They want to capture that. They want to they have more of that beauty. That's the reason why they place their entire life on line, in order to have that beauty in their lives. You know, in, in that sense, I think Christians are just like artists. People don't understand us. Sometimes our parents outcast us. You know, it's like, I don't know you, you know. But you do it, the, although the world may not understand you, you place your entire life online for what? For the beauty that you have understood. For the beauty that you have seen in Christ Jesus. That's the one thing that you want in your life. It's to pursue after God's glory. That's how you change. But you see it? You can do it. You cannot do it. But you will be able to do it in Christ who strengthens you. That looks very, very similar so when you, when you don't stay awake, and if you don't stay awake, and if you don't discern, you'll be deceived. You're like, oh my goodness, everything's look all, you know, pretty much all the same. You go after it, but it starts, it starts like this. Towards the end, it's a completely different destination. So I'm going to encourage you, brothers and sisters, stay awake. Now, too, and forever. So number one, the world. Number two, let's talk about... Um, us, Christians. And one of the reasons why I had to share about the world is because of this. And that's the same reason why I showed you the video. How was the video? Was it, was it okay, understandable? Actually, um, one of my staff members made that. And it's a guy that I work with, Jesus Generation Movement. He's a computer programmer. He actually made that, and he actually gave it to me so I can use it in the U.S. during my trip. And actually, I, I actually had asked him to make that, make that video. I even gave him the theme of this is exactly how you know, I want you to make the video. And uh, there's a reason why I did that, because the world that we live in is not a peaceful world. I was actually in uh, Pektusan. Do you know where Pektusan is? It's, um, it's, the, it's the highest Korean mountain. Um, that's on the border of North Korea and China. So um, it's right on the border. So half of Pektusan, Mount Pektu, is, um, is, belongs to North Korea, and the half of the mountain belongs to China. And it's actually a um, live volcano, but it's been sleeping for so many years. Just recently, I was actually there. About a few months ago, I was there. And you know, I make a regular visit to Pektusan, the, the peak of Pektusan, uh, like throughout the year. But this time, it's the first time back in two years. When I actually went back, it actually broke my heart. The reason is, this time, 
the feature of the Pictou of Pictou Mountain has changed. Every time I go, I found Pictou really, really beautiful with a lot of grass, green, and it's beautiful. But this time I returned, it actually broke my heart because the entire mountain is um, dried up because of the heat that's coming up from the bottom. All the grass is withered. All the trees are withering. And in fact, I talked to one of the people, local people that's living around there. They said one day, yeah, it was actually on the news, one day they saw these insects, like flock of insects migrating to another place. The next day they saw this flock of snakes migrating to another place. They feel the heat and the vibration that's coming up from the bottom. North Korean government, the Chinese government, agreed that Pekdusan will probably erupt by year 2013. If that does, you know what the biggest problem is? It's not the lava or the magma that comes out. You know what the biggest problem of Pekdusan is? Why do you think God has shown us the disaster that took place in Japan? Tsunami, earthquake, and the nuclear plant accident. Why do you think that happened? A lot of people have, you know, I can't believe people actually have the guts to say this. Oh, J Japan doesn't repent, so God has struck them, and Korea, God's blessing them so much because Korean people are the, are, are the Christians. Do you think that's really the reason why God struck Japan like that? I'm going to tell you the reason. Jesus says in the, in the Gospels, Jesus says, do you think the Galileans who died from the accident, the freak accident, do you think they died because of their sins? Do you think the people that were building the tower and the tower crumbled down and people died from that accident, do you think people died from their own sins? Jesus says, do you think their sins are greater than yours? Jesus says, if you don't, unless you repent, unless you repent, you will also perish. That's the message that the Fukushima event, incident is giving us to the rest of the world. If you don't repent, something worse is going to happen to the rest of us. If Pekdusan erupts, the biggest problem is not the lava that comes out. The biggest problem is this. In North Korean government has nuclear waste that's um, being stored in underground of entire North Korea. Fukushima nuclear energy is used for energy, you know? But North Korea, the nuclear power is actually stored up to be weaponized. It's going to be so much worse form of, form of energy. And when, when that thing erupts, those things are going to have a lot of leakage. And uh, that's the future, that, uh, that's, that's, that's the event that the future, uh, our, our future holds. And while that's going on, what's going on with Israel? What's going on in the Middle East? There's a reason why I travel to the Middle East, because that's one place where you're going to be able to really sense that Jesus is coming. The Egyptian revolution took place. Right after that, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Morocco, and many other places had the Islamic revolution. People thought it was just a revolution for democracy, but it turned out to be not a revolution for democracy, but it, was, it actually turned out to be the Islamic revolution. Why? Now the Islamic forces are now combining all the powers together under one reign. It's called Islamic unification. When that happens, they're going to come for one holy city. You know where that is? Jerusalem. What does the book of Zechariah say in Zechariah chapter 12 through chapter 14? It says, on the last day, the world, the entire, all the nations will gather around Israel. They'll try to lift up Israel to divide up the land again. That's exactly what's going on right now. Yeah. You know, the time has come, and tomorrow is going to be tribulation and not peace. So how do I live as a Christian? Let's read verse 5 together. Verse 5, let's read this together. Verse 5, loudly, together, ready, go. Amen. I said to you earlier, um, when I was, I said to you earlier um, this afternoon, if I come here during this three days, if I were to share, you know, everything's going to be fine. Don't have to worry about it. If you try really hard, you're going to, live, you're going to be able to live a good life. If you try really, really hard, God's going to mightily use you. You know what? That's an easy sermon for me. Everybody loves me for that. But I'm not going to do that because woe to me. If I do that, that's not the reality. That's not the truth. But just like any other time throughout the history, I want you to remind you one thing, and that is this. Uh, tomorrow's going to be tribulation, not peace. If that's the reality that we're facing, it's not 
the right thing before God is it's, it's probably a foolish thing, a foolish thing rather for us to think, you know, praying for our li- God change the world, you know, everything's gonna be fine. That's not the desire of God. You know what the desire is? God says, bless all the nations. However, no matter how the world may change, no matter how the entire world crumbles down, I want you to have such a faith, such Christianness that you'll be able to withstand in the last days. It is to change yourself, your entire framework that you're going to be able to withstand, endure through the entire last days. So first thing God mentions is this, be sober-minded. Please repeat after me, be sober-minded. What does it mean to be sober-minded? So being sober-minded means wake up to it and discern. Know what the truth is, what is not the truth. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to remind you this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, on the last day, everybody is going to come in the name of Jesus. You know what that means? Here's Jesus, there's Jesus, there's the Messiah, there's the Messiah. Everybody's going to come in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? Everything is going to say, oh, Jesus told me to do this, Jesus told me to do that. Everybody's going to come in the name of Jesus. But the problem is, you have to discern. Is this really from the Lord or is this not from the Lord? Is this really complete and a pure gospel or is this just a biased opinion of someone? Unless you stay awake, unless you discern, you will never be able to discern. That's why in the book of Philippians, uh, Apostle Paul actually mentions this. I want you to really understand, I want you to really discern what is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. It's not just a matter of good and bad. You have to pass that point. After a certain point, you're not doing it just because it's good. You're doing it because it's pleasing to the Lord. But after a certain point, you're not just concerned with whether this is pleasing to the Lord. You have to be concerned, as you live in this last day, you have to be concerned, is this a perfect will of God? So I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, I'm going to really ask you to stay up, wake up to it, now understand, is this good or is this wrong? And if it's good, is this pleasing to before the Lord? And if it's pleasing, or is this perfect will of the Lord? Discerning like that throughout your entire life will enable you to be able to live out this life according to the word of God, according to the will of God. Unless you do that, you're going you're gonna to be, um, be making mistakes in your life without you realizing you're, you, you, what, what you're doing. Number two, after, number one is be sober-minded. Number two, please repeat after me, endure sufferings. And your sufferings, <laughs> you know, um, more than any any other time in history, I think there's one Christian worldview that must be organized in our hearts. The Christian worldview is this. Please repeat after me. All right, there's a lot of repeating today, but please do. Um, tomorrow is tribulation, not peace. That's the Christian worldview. That's one Christian worldview that we have to have as a Christian. Because the Bible says over and over throughout the Bible, what does it say? When the persecution comes to you, when the suffering comes to you in this last day and age, do not be surprised. In other words, expect it. Because that is part of our Christian worldview. This will happen to you. What does Book of Matthew say? What does um, what does what does Matthew chapter twenty four, Mark chapter thirteen, uh, Luke chapter twenty one? What does uh, John seventeen? What does what do they say about this? Do they say everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be worked out? Some abstract optimism. Does he talk about that? What does the Bible say? The Bible says in the last days, there's going to be famines, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be persecutions, there's going to be tribulation. Be ready for that. So, brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you today, now accept the truth. Say, tomorrow's going to be and not good time. So people say, oh, Happy New Year, but I'm going to give you this message. Actually, this is the message that I preached in Los Angeles before I came here. They actually asked me to come uh, on and preach the last message of 2011 on Christmas Day, and I actually share this. Happy New Year, I'm going to say that out of respect, but if you really look at the Happy New Year, it actually means two things. In that happiness, two things exist. One, it's going to be greater tribulation than 2011. But number two, it's going to be a greater revival. Time of a greater, greater, greater revival in 2012. 
So that's the happy new year. That's the good news. But in reality, it's going to get harder and more difficult and more difficult and more difficult. So there's one thing that I promised before God. As a missionary, it's not an easy life to live sometimes. And I talked about going, take, uh, going to the western part of the world, leaving China, because that's where the gospel movement is right now. Fire, fire you know, burning up. You know, that's a fire of the revival burning up. Now, taking the gospel, traveling the rest of one-third of the way back into Jerusalem, the every so, uh, uh, transportation infrastructure is already ready for us. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, it says, prepare the way of the Lord, make a highway in the wilderness. You know what? The highways are already ready, completed. You don't have to make it. They're, they've been they've made for us already. There's, There's at least another road highway. called the Asian Highway. Some of you may think, oh, well, big deal, you know, that's China, but like, what does it have to do with us, Koreans? But I'm going to tell you, time has come. For the longest time, for 5,000 years, God has prepared this Silk Road. Now the time has come, as if God's pulling this rubber bands, God pulled it all the way to Korea, and he has planted it in the southern part of Korea. There's a southernmost city on the west side called Mokpo to Daejeon. And there's Yosu, the central south, southern city, Yosu to Daejeon. And eastern south city, Busan to Daejeon. There's a main highways connecting in Daejeon area. And from Daejeon, it goes straight up to Seoul. Until now, from uh, the, the highway that's, uh, that travels from Seoul to Busan is called the capital Busan highway, Gyeongbu Gosokdoro. But you will not find that name anymore in Korea. Because when you actually get on when you travel down the number one highway, there's a new name for it. You know what that is? On the street sign, on the highway sign, you know what it says? Asian Highway Number One. You know why? Because that's no longer the Korean highway. Because once you reach Seoul, the road splits up. One goes to the westward, one goes to the eastward. The one goes to the eastward, that crosses 38th parallel, it goes into Hamung, and it travels straight up to the, where the where the Tuman River ends, and it crosses over into Vladivostok. And from Vladivostok, it takes the Siberian Railroad track. It goes to Moscow, Istanbul, and into Jerusalem. One that travels the westward, it goes straight up to Pyongyang. From Pyongyang, Shiniju. Shiniju, we cross the Yalu River into Dandong. From Dandong to Xinyang, Xinyang to Beijing, joins the Silk Road. It travels straight to Jerusalem. And there is the Trans-Siberian Railroad track that travels from Vladivostok to Jerusalem. Guys, the highway is completely ready. The platform has already been set. God says, you know what? It's ready. And what are we doing? Not yet. <laughs> Somebody go. <laughs> yeah, it's ready. Like, when I know the gospel is traveling so fast, I wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh my goodness, what if the gospel leaves me behind? But I'm going to tell you, the, the ways are ready. And um, as you travel that road, it's not easy because there's Islam, more Islam, communism, more Islam, Hinduism, more Islam, and more Islam. All the way to Jerusalem, there's many obstacles. When you do that, after that three months long trip, I come back to Beijing, my home. Guess what happens? I'm like, my beard's all grown up, and my hair's like without gel, and you know, it's, I wear it's dirty clothes. I haven't washed myself like for about, for, for about a week, and I've been on the train for like three months, literally going from Beijing to Jerusalem. I come back, and when I come back, I get really worn out. I'm like really tired. I get into my room and I sleep. When I wake up, sometimes I complain to God, God, no more. I'm not gonna go anymore. But you know what God says? This is not, the thing hasn't even begun. It's going to be so much worse tomorrow. Now you wake up, you stand up, get well rested, and we're going to do this again. So there's one promise that I made to God. All the days of my life, every, all the days of my life, I promised to God. I said, until the day that I see Jesus Christ face to face, I will never say in my life, I'm tired. Or it's too much for me. I'll never say that in my life. Because... Tomorrow is going to be so much worse than today. And tomorrow is going to be so much, uh, uh, day after tomorrow is so much, it's going to be so much worse than tomorrow. As the time goes, it's going to be so much worse. You think junior high is bad? Go to high school. <laughs> you think high school is bad? 
You think keeping your faith in high school is bad? No. Go to college. It's going to be so much more difficult. You think going to college and keeping your faith is like hard? Once you really get into the real world and have a family to feed, then you think about how you can keep your faith. Don't complain about today, but think about there's a greater tribulation that's coming on our way. So endure sufferings, the Bible says. That the world's going to change. It's not going to change. You have to change. You have to withstand. Number three, please repeat after me. Number one, what was number one? Be sober-minded. I was just testing you. Number two, endure sufferings. Number three, please repeat after me. Do the work, work, work uh, of an evangelist. Um, what does it mean by do, do the work of an evangelist? I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm just going to briefly um, summarize this. The best form of mission, the best form of mission is this. The best form of mission or best form of evangelism is to show people in the presence of people, as people are watching you, you, you show them how much you fear God. And that's actually the problem in Korea right now. A lot of people lightly treat our God. Our, our God. You know why? Because even Christians treat our God so lightly, we don't even fear God anymore. How, how do you expect the world to fear your God? The big, the, probably the most effective form of mission, the most effective form of evangelism, the most effective form of worship, you know what that is? In the presence of people, as people are watching you, you fear your, you fear your God. You live God consciously. You live your life as God is watching you 24-7. And the people will know there's real God in you. You know, I experienced God when I was in seventh grade, and I was 13 years when I was 13 years old. And when I actually experienced God in the Philippines, I I was actually healed. I got I got really sick, right? And I experienced God's love, and I was healed. I came back to Japan. I was able to finish up the the remaining 10 days of my mission trip. I actually came to Japan, and I was stand as I was starting my eighth grade year. I actually prayed to God, God, I want to live for you now. God, if you love me so much, and you have become the real matter in my life, I want to live for you now. Please tell me what what I can do to serve you. As I was praying when I was in eighth grade, I would wake up, I would kneel down and pray. When I come back from school, I would kneel down in front of the bed, I would pray. But one day, as I was praying, Jesus actually said to me something really interesting through the word of God. He says, do you really want to follow me? And I said, yes, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, whoever wants to follow me will have to deny himself, pick up your cross, then follow me. And until then, I never knew what the cross of Jesus Christ really entails. What does, what does it mean by Jesus Christ? Carry your cross. Pick up your own cross. What does that mean? You know, I grew up in the church. I've heard many Christian elderly talking about their testimony, referring to the cross. They say, oh, my marriage is so bad. This is the cross that God has entrusted to me. Does it really mean suffering? But I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, cross of Jesus Christ doesn't sim- does not simply mean suffering. Cross of Jesus Christ means submission. Because Jesus Christ didn't have to suffer, but he chose to suffer. Why? In submission to God. Jesus Christ didn't have to be crucified. He he could have come down, but he chose to draw his last breath. He chose every second that he's going to be crucified, he's going to die on the cross. You know why? Because he wanted to do that in submission to God's will. So when 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 God says, do you really want to follow me? Do you really want to live a life that glorifies to me? And God says, then you submit yourself to me. Then follow me. And I said, I was in eighth grade. Just think about it. Eighth graders, you know, what do they know? I'm sorry. But I was in eighth grade. And I said, God, you know, how am I supposed to submit myself to you? What do you want me to do? And this is what Jesus said. God gave me this heart. Just a realization. I, 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 he actually asked me a question that I still can't forget. He said, do you think it's by chance that you go to school as a student right now? And I was praying. I was like, what? And God was giving me affirmation in my heart. He was saying, you going to that school as a student is not by chance. I, as the, with the authority of God, have placed you as a student in that school I have, I have designated for you. So whether you know why you have to study or why don't you, why you, whether you, whether you know that or not, whether your grades are you know, really good or bad, it doesn't matter. I have placed you in that school as a student. Therefore, you submit yourself to me and you fulfill your uh, 
your life, your role as a student, just do your best. You know, at that point, my grades were really bad, you know, like, like all Fs. I'm not, I'm not extra, how, what's the word? It starts with D, ends with B. There's a U-M in the bit between. I'm not extra, you know, that. But, you know, think about it. I was in Korea until I was 10. I went to Japan when I was 10 years old, and I went to international school where students from 17 different nations came together to study in English. All my textbooks were in English. All my teachers were Americans and British. So when you actually go to that school, if you don't even understand a single word in, Japan, in English, what do you do? When the, you, know, you know how they are. You know, you know how that is, right? especially those 1.5 generations, right? You go to school, and teacher gives me this like, test, exam. You're just sitting there, you're like, like, you're guessing. All Fs. I actually shared this testimony in Korea. And then I said, you know, I was like, I, I used to get all Fs. And one of the students was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I was like, why? He's like, fantastic, fantastic. I was like, no, it's not fantastic. F is like fail. <laughs> the F doesn't stand for fantastic. It means fail. Just, just to clear that up, right? It's all, all F, 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 F. I had one A, actually. That's the P, right? And a straight F. Because I don't speak English. It's really bad. That, you know, my English was really, really bad. It's even until even now, I still struggle. But back then, think about it. Just, I'm just going to give you one instance. Actually, um, my, when I first went to school, my first day of school, when I was thir uh, 10 years old, I was going to school. And uh, I was riding in the back of the car, my dad driving with the window down in the summertime. And uh, my father actually was worried about me and my sister because, you know, two kids without knowing a single word in English, my father is taking us to the school. He's kind of worried his parents. So he said, well, um, I'm just going to tell you one word. When you go to school, people say something to you. And if you don't understand, just say, I don't know. <laughs> but because of the window, the you know, wind blowing, right? <laughs> me sitting in the back seat with my sister, I misheard. I said, when my dad said, say, I don't know, and I heard, you don't know. <laughs> so that's the word that I learned, first word. Now, after going to, going to school for the first week, uh, going to the first week of school, I actually went to the airport to go to back, to back to Korea, you know, one week of school, enrolling, and right after I enrolled, after about a week, there was spring break, so I was at the airport with my dragon, dragon ball bag, and I went to the airport, you know, back then, I was wearing shorts, I pulled, got pulled all the way up here, getting wedgies, and, you know, socks all the way up to your knees, and with my dragon ball, you know, they, I went to the airport with my sister, and, you know, and there was uh, this friend from school, she was also at the airport with her mom, and they were like, hey, how are you? I was like, hi. And this girl came to me. It's like, how are you? I was like, fine, thank you. And she, 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 her mother asked me, so you're a new student. And I understood that part. So I said, hmm. And then she actually said, so um, where are you going? And I understood that. So I said, Korea. And they said, so what flight? I didn't know. Flight? I was like, you don't know. <laughs> and she was like, of course I don't know, honey. So what, what flight? It's like, you don't know. And she asked me, S -s what airline? I was like, you don't know. You know, I started from there. <laughs> All F. And people who don't, study well, when their grades are already bad, they have no more motivation to study. So I, I would ask questions like, what, why do I have to learn this? Especially mathematics. I just never understood why I have to learn that. Yeah, I, I would go to like my math teacher named Mr. Binongo. He's a Filipino guy. His name's Mr. Binongo. He's actually a professor right now at Emory. And uh, I would go talk to him every day. Mr. Binongo, Mr. Binongo. He's like, oh, what's up? And I said, 
I don't know why you have to learn this stuff, man. You, you'll never use this mathematics and like signs and codes. You'll never learn this in, school, like, in your real life. And Mr. Rilong was like, what? I was like, back home, you know, my parents are talking to each other. I've never heard my mom saying to my father, your, Pyth your, your, your Pythagorean theorems are really, really beautiful. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Why do I have to learn this? There's absolutely no, motiva no motivation to study. But that day, I said to God, I said, God, I really am not confident that I'm going to ever raise my grades from all F to something else. And I really don't know why I even have to go to school. I really don't want to go to school. But there's one thing that I know. God, who loved me, has placed me in that school as a student. And I will submit to you. And I said, I will fulfill my role as a student. And as, as my worship to you, as my worship to you, this is what I can offer to you, I said, because I, live, I want to live a God-conscious life I want to go to school and come back in submission to you, as a sign of my submission to you. I want to sit down in front of the desk for three hours every day and study. Whether it's good or not, I'm just going to study for three hours. That's a promise that I made to God. And the second thing that God asked me is this. Do you think it was by, it was by sure chance that you were born in the family that you're born in? It's not an accident. It's not somebody's mistake. It was not by somebody's sin that you were born in that family. No matter what kind of family condition that you may be in, no matter what kind of family problem that you may have, it's not by chance. It's not an accident. It's not somebody's mistake. God says, I, judging it from my infinite wisdom, good wisdom, I had to place you in that family because I loved you so much. And I said, oh, God, I really don't understand, but in my submission to you, I will love the Father that is so hard to forgive. I will love and serve the family that you have entrusted to me. On that day, God asked me again, do you think you go to that church by accident? No, it was not your choice, but it was my choice. Now you go serve that church that I have entrusted to you. And that's what I did. The entire year, I just did whatever I promised to God. I didn't think about the grades. I didn't think about anything else. I, I, there was only one thing in my mind. You know what that is? Submission to God. I'll just do whatever you have entrusted to me. I'll just do my best. God... I'll, I'll let you worry about the rest. I'm just going to do my best. That's what I did. After about a year, I was in my, sitting in my classroom. My, my friend actually came to call me. He's like, hey, go check out the bulletin board. I went out in my school. There's a huge chalkboard with, like, entire school's grades, student grades. So, you know, I was like, oh, my goodness. I can't. I'm going to start looking for my name. So I went from the very bottom to the middle section. I still couldn't find my name. I was like, oh, my goodness. Maybe it went up. And I was thinking a little, with a little glimpse of hope, I went from the middle to the rank 10. And guess what? My, my name's still not there. I was thinking, oh my gosh, I, I got expelled. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Maybe they don't even want me anymore in the school. My name's gone. And I was thinking, maybe, maybe, I went from rank 10 up, up, entering the high honor roll section, going up, 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 first place, Daniel Kim. It's, seriously, because um, when I talk about this kind of testimony, a lot of people think I'm very smart, but I'm not. You know, when Jesus Christ actually um, performed a miracle, changing the water into wine, it's really interesting. People, the only people that knew that was actually from water. The only, per, only people that knew that was Jesus himself and the servants who brought that water to Jesus. You know, Jesus knows what kind of uh, person I am, how much I lack, what, are, what my weaknesses are. But the only person that knows what kind of person I could be is Jesus who can change me. So my grades went up, and all the people are like, oh my goodness, your grades are going up. And, and I was surprised too. But, you know, um, I, I wasn't worried about, I'm going to go to good college. I was concerned about one thing. I'm just going to live a God-conscious life. I'm just going to live God-centered life. This is my um, sign of my um, dedication to you. I'm going to honor you through, through my studies, through the way that I serve my family, through the way that I'm going to serve my church. Simple as that. My grades were going up. People are praising me. It's like, oh, you studied so well. Can you teach me? Can you tutor me? You know, I became a hero in school. Grades are soaring up. 8th grade, ninth grade, and guess what? 
the moment I entered the, uh, entered the 10th grade year, the grade that was supposed to keep on going up, he started to do this. And I was frustrated. God, what's wrong? You know, you should have messed up the 8th grade and ninth grade year, not the high school years. You know, this is the grade that I have to send to my college. You know, raise up my grade. But guess what? The entire year has gone by without being able to raise my grade to where it was. The entire year has gone by, me having problems with my teachers and my friends. Teachers used to tell me, you don't study anymore, do you? I said, I'm trying, but the grades are falling. I'm afraid that my grades are going to fall. I have to go to good college. I have to go get a good job. You know, I have to you know, do all these things in my life. But somehow the grades were constantly falling. And when it finally hit the pit bottom, the entire year ended. Towards the end of the year, we actually had the um, um, award ceremony, reward cer award ceremony in school. So all the student bodies and teachers and parents, everybody got together in the big auditorium. The, uh, the principal went up to the front and he actually said, I'm going to start the award ceremony. And he says, um, person who uh, deserves the English class award, come up. And he was passing out all the awards to good students, right? And the last award came, the time of, good, uh, the, time of the last reward. It's, a, it's, a, it's called the PTA award. Parents, teacher have discussed and they decided this is a student that deserves to be a role model in this school. And I'm going to give the scholarship to this student, and I'm going to give the PTA award. It's a great award, you know? The time has come. They were announcing the recipient, the name of the recipient of this PTA award. As they were announcing, my heart's pounding. You know, I was like, God, please, please. You know, that's one award that I deserve. You know, I used to live for the glory of God. But come on, you know, I deserve that award. And as, as he was, you know, announcing the recipient's name, my name was not the name that was called. My friend, who's a Mormon, who was a Mormon church, a Mormon missionary son, his name was called. He went up to the stage, and the principal gave him the award along with the scholarship. And I was really ashamed because I was representing God. I was representing Christianity. You know, I told you earlier, uh, my school, there were students from 17 different countries came together to study together. They didn't only bring their cultures, they didn't only bring their nationalities, but they also brought their own gods, their own religions. In my school, there were many, many different religions, Islam, Jews, um, Shintoists, Buddhism, Catholics. You know, there's many religions that you don't even ever hear, hear of. Namnyo <laughs> Horengikyo, or like, you never hear of that, what? Like, Omu like, you, you, there's like thousands of religions in my school being represented by, 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 by every student body. You know, but there is me, a Christian. If you go into the like, lunch, area, lunch area of my school during lunchtime, it's really interesting. Everybody's praying to their own God. <laughs> like Islamic guys. <laughs> they're praying, right? And even the Christian, guy, the Christian guys are probably the most shameful guys about their own God. They're like, they look around, make sure nobody's watching. <laughs> You know, this, like, there's weird Japanese religious people. They, they pray really hard. At lunchtime, they hold their bento box. They're like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> That's what they eat <laughs> Then there was me, representing Christian, lep representing God. And that award didn't come to me, but it went to Mormons. I was so ashamed. I was sorry to God. And I, so I came home. I was shaken up. And says, as soon as I came home, I knelt down before the bed. I prayed to God, God, because of my weakness, because of who I am, I have, um, I have disgraced your name. I have made you comparison to the false gods. I made the false god to be more magnified and more glorified. And I have, let, I have pulled down your glory to, the, to pull down your glory. And as I was praying, I just didn't feel enough. So I decided to open up my uh, closet. I opened my bag. I packed up all my clothes. And my mother actually knew exactly where I was coming from. And she said, you know what? I'm going to buy you a Korean Air airplane ticket. So she bought me that. I took the bag. I took the Korean Air, Air, Air ticket. I flew to Korea. I, who finished um, the 10th the grade year, has come to Korea during the summer break. And I actually went up to the prayer mountain, Kidoon. So when I went to the prayer mountain, there was one task, one choice. Should I um, completely abstain from food and drinks, or should I just abstain from 
food. So I, I decided, which side am I going to live longer? So if I abstain from food, but if I continue to you know, drink water, I'm going to be able to live for 40 days, which means if God decides to answer me 40 days later, you know, good luck to me, right? But if I abstain from food and drink altogether, the longest that I'm going to ever live is probably about seven days. And, you know, which, which side do you think God's going to answer faster? So in my simple mind, I thought, you know, I'm just going to abstain from everything. I'm just going to encounter God. I'm going to ask him to forgive me. So I didn't drink a water, a single drop of water. I, I abstained from food. And I started praying in, the, praying in the mountain. I prayed to God, God, you've created me to glorify your name. You've created me so your name will be glorified amongst people because people see my good deeds so they can glorify you. But because of my weakness, because of my mistakes that I've made in my life, your name is disgraced. Your name has been compared, and your name has been weighed and been compared um, with, with other gods, and your name, the, gl the glory of your name has fallen to the ground. Forgive me for that. And I started praying. One day has passed, two days have passed, and the third day, this is, this is how I become... Uh, I'm dying literally on the third day, you know, because I was so thirsty. I didn't, draw, I didn't drink a single drop of water. I was star I starved for three days. But I still remember all night I prayed. I was on the mountain slope, lying down there. The entire mountain was filled with uh, pine trees. I was just lying there. I still remember at 5, 5 a.m. in the morning, God came to my heart and he spoke to me. First word that he, God spoke to me woke me up. I was sleeping. You know, my body is sleeping, but your mind's completely awake because you're, I've been starving for three days. I didn't eat, yeah, I didn't eat anything, so your, your mind's sharp. So I'm just on the slope. I was just like lying down. God spoke to me at 5 a.m. The first word that woke me up with is this. He says, who has created the man's mouth? That, those are the words God has spoken to Moses. Moses said to God, I can't go rescue the Israelites. What does God say to Moses? Who has created man's mouth? I was, I was, I was, I was just sleeping. I woke up. I was like, what? And God said to me in my heart, who has created a man's mouth? Who has made a man deaf? Who has, made, uh, who has made a man blind? Who has made someone who speaks very good English or poor English? Who has made a person to do well in math and poor in math? Who has made a person to get perfect score in SAT? And who has made a person to study really, really hard and still not excel in SAT? It is I, the Lord. My interest in you was never the grades, not never the outcome. I was never interested in how well you do. But I was interested in one thing, that is this. You go to school, you come back. Because you're conscious of me, because you want to worship me, because you want to honor me, because you, because you want to acknowledge me as a God, because you, wanted to, you decided to submit yourself to me, I was able to be glorified through that. And I thought about it, and I think I've changed. In the beginning, initially, when I went to school, I come back, I decided I'm going to sit in front of the desk for three hours, and I decided to you know, just really do things in submission to God not worrying about the results, not worrying about the grades. But at that point, after a certain point, I think I changed. I, I think I changed in a bad way. I, I think I changed in the way that maybe I'm more concerned about the college. I have to get good grades to make my parents proud. And I'm going to have to try really hard, not because of God, but I'm going to do really hard, so I'm going to make a living for myself. I'm going to go to good college, get a good job, make a good, good, good life. So my motives in my life has shifted from God-centeredness to my own success. And God, I said to God, God, it's already too late. I have no desire to go back to school. My, my grades are already messed up. I, I can't go back. And Jesus says, and God says to me, he says, I can still make the, the nothing into something. It is I, the Lord, who makes the dead come alive and the life um, goes into death. And he says, um, you be concerned with one thing, that is you submitting yourself to me. Do everything in the worship of me. You honor me through every day of your life by living a God-conscious life. I'm going to be watching you 24-7 with my eyes that never leaves you, that doesn't slumber nor sleep. But if you pass in my eyes, 
That's the, that's the purpose. That's the reason why you have to go to school for. And I said to God, God, if that's the thing, not worrying about the result, not worrying about the grades, I will go back to school. Now, I'll leave the rest to you. I'm just going to live. I'm going to live for one thing. That is to pass the test before you. I'm going to live a life that honors you. And I said that, and I went back to, I went back to Japan. As I was starting uh, my uh, 11th grade, junior year in high school, it's really, you know, scary because, you know, I was afraid that I'm going to change God. I'm going to change again. I was afraid that I'm going to betray God again. I'm gonna, I was afraid that I was going to um, forget about God again. So I would wake up in the morning. I was always, like, you know, the first day of school, going, going back to school after the long summer break for my junior year, you know, I thought to myself, oh, God, you know, I'm so scared. I don't want to go to school. Am I gonna, really going to be able to glorify you this year? But my mother actually knew me, so she actually said, said, come over here. And as I was leaving for school, my mom made me sit down. My sister next to me, my mom was, held our hands together, and she actually prayed. God, in the place where there's million, eight million gods of Japan, and when students come over from different places of the world saying that their god is the real god, I'm going to send these two children as a missionary to school to glorify your name and let the entire world know that you are the only God. And I would say, Mom, I'll go to school. And I'll go to school. But yeah, you're actually afraid because you're afraid that your weaknesses, your, your character flaws, and your mistakes that you make in, in your daily life, you're afraid the things that people see in you will actually hinder them away from knowing the Lord. So I actually was very desperate when I go to school. So when I go to school, I actually pray. When you go to school, it's about an hour and a half on the train, the Japanese train. It's packed, jam-packed. The, the, the people that work in the station, they come out and they push you in. So you can't fit in. The, you, know, it's a, you, you literally go to school like this for an hour and a half. But you're so desperate that you might be, you're, you're afraid that you're going to hinder people away from knowing the Lord. So this is how you pray. You know, God, with my face, my facial expressions, my words, my eye contact, my emotions, my words, everything that I do, I don't want any of those things to hinder people away from knowing, knowing you. I want my good deeds to reflect your glory so that people may see me and they, they're going to be able to glorify you. That was my prayer. And this is how you pray. You're already packed. You can't pray. This is how you pray. <laughs> and what do you do? Sometimes you just want to like, emphasize, like, God, please, like, I'm desperate. What do you do? This is how you do it. Mm, 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 mm. If you see a guy like this, what do you do? Run! <laughs> That's what I did. I said, I was on the train jam-packed, like you can't even move around, you're just standing there, mm, 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 mm. what do you do? People are like, <laughs> I'm just standing there, mm, 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 mm. You know what? My friend actually got on that train every single morning, but he never said hi to me. <laughs> he actually spread the rumor in the school. So when I go to school, people actually knew about me. So I go to school every day, and there comes the, the new um, terminology that's been coined throughout the entire school because of me. So I go throughout the school to go down the hallway saying good morning to people. It's like, good morning, and my friends go, mm. <laughs> So I'm sitting in the classroom as I'm taking the exam. I'm constantly praying, mm, 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 mm. My mom was actually worried about me. It's like, oh my goodness, like, do you want to go see a counselor? <laughs> No matter what people say, I know what I, why I did that. You know why? Every single moment, I was readjusting my heart to God. Constantly. God, every thought that passes through my mind, would you sanctify me? I want to focus on you. I want to focus on you. God's glory. God's glory. I want to be God conscious. I'm, I'm conscious of you. I'm going to conscious of you. Every decision that I make, every turn that I make, everything that I do, every breath that I take, I exist for you. Every moment I pray, mm, 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 mm. Crazy, but you know what? That's probably the happiest time of my life. Looking back, that is probably God, probably the most God-fearing time of my life. When I did that, actually, God actually said to me, one thing, I'm going to tell you what to do for this school. And I said, what? And God said, that morning, he said, now you send out a letter to the entire school. I was like, no. And I submitted myself. And just guess what? Starting with the principal to all the teachers, all the student body, all the parents, I send them to their homes too. 
And little kids, kindergarten is it's international, international school. Our student body goes from kindergarten, pre-K, all the way to 12th graders. So to, to my little kids, I say, take this to your mom. <laughs> Entire school saw the letter. I wrote it, and this is what the letter says. If you're hiding as a Christian, come out. If you deny the Lord before these people, on the last day, Jesus himself will deny you before the Father and the angels. But if you come out and let, let us acknowledge the Lord, let us fear the Lord, and let the world know that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and let us come together as a Christian to pray for this school, to pray for this school salvation. Guess what? People started to antagonize me. And it was not, it was not enough. I really fear the Lord. So I, I would go to school. I said, you know what, God, I'm going to pray in this school for three times a day. Morning time, I go to school. Like, I go straight to school. I go pray. Lunch time, I eat lunch. I come down and pray. And dinner time, I, I, the third time, I would, but when, I, when the school's over, I, before I go home, I come down and pray. Where? And there is one place, one location in school that I can actually pray without being disturbed, usually. Where is that? Bathroom. But you don't close the stall and you don't sit there. You don't, you don't do that. I was thinking about Rocky Balboa. Before the match, he, what does he do? He kneels down before the sink and he prays. I, I thought about it. He was role, my, my role model. Yeah. Rocky Balboa. He's, he's, so I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to pray like that. So when I, go to the, when I go to school, I go straight to the bathroom. I kneel down before the basin, the sink, and I pray three times a day. Because that's the only way to sustain myself before God, righteous before God. And students would come in and say, oh my goodness, what are you doing? My teachers would say, oh my goodness, stand up, stand up. There's rumors going around the entire school saying, that guy is crazy. But you know what? That didn't end from there. I took the Bible because the passion that God has given me was about to swallow me up. So I was on fire for God, so I took the Bible. I went out to downtown. The, the city that I was living in back then was, was the third largest city in Japan. Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka. And in, in Fukuoka, there's a downtown area called Tenjin. That's the one location where thousands of people walk around and thousands of cars are driven, being driven around. So actually, I stand in the main street where the main, you know, you know uh, how do you say, the, the cro- uh, where, where, where people cross the street. I'm just standing there and you know, just think about it. A junior, like, 11th grader in high school, I would stand there with a the Bible. Guess what? People don't listen to me. They push me around. I say, see what I say, So I looked around. What is the best way, the most effective way for me to share the gospel? I looked up. Guess, right next to the, cro- the, the crossing, there is a guardrail that comes up, the fence. So I climbed up the fence. As people are passing by, they're looking at me. What is he doing? I'm looking down on people, but it's really hard to get the balance because it's really you know, narrow. So what do you do? There's a stoplight waiting for you, ready for you. So you, you, you cling on to the stoplight, and you start preaching the gospel. Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ is the salvation. If you believe Jesus, heaven. If you don't, you're going to go to hell. It's a strong message, but that was the simplest message that I could preach to Japanese people. Because Japanese people, they go through their, they go through a through their entire life without being able to hear a single word about the gospel. I would share my sisters passing out the tracks in the bottom. And it's Saturday night at 7 o'clock, so people throw bottles and water bottles at us. And as I'm preaching, I'm just like avoiding and start preaching. The police officers come, they drag me down, go to another, another place and share the gospel. It's not illegal. If it were illegal, I wouldn't have done. But if people complain, they have to kick us out. They, they would come and say, please don't do this. Come, go, go somewhere else and come back later. So I would do somebody some, somewhere else and I'd come back later. Uh, you know what? I, starting then, I didn't skip, skip a single day of doing that. Every Saturday night at 7 p.m., I was there. You know, I'm not a great preacher when it comes to the words and stuff like that. Sometimes I think to myself, hey, God, you know, why me? But there's one thing that I know God looks around the entire world and he still searches for one person that fears the Lord. Back then, I think God has seen me and that's the reason why God is still using me right now. You know, that's how my entire year has gone by, serving the Lord, just sharing out there on the street, 
praying in the bathroom, mm, mm, doing that in the tra- on the train, and studying really hard, serving God, serving the family, serving the church. I never thought about the grades. I never thought about the outcome. I mean, I just wanted to do things in submission to God. And the last day came. It was the day the entire students came, parents, teachers. It was a award ceremony. And just like the previous year, the principal went up, and he actually did the award ceremony, passing out all the awards. And the last, last award, time of the last award presentation came. What is it? PT award. It was the parent-teacher uh, award. They discussed who the best student is, the role model, and they were about to present this award. But guess what? The funny thing happened. I, was never, I, 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 I wasn't interested in that, in that award anymore. I'm just sitting there. I was like, okay, whatever. Because there's one reason. I was able to hear a one, a one, one word, um, maybe it's just a voice of God in my heart. He was telling me one thing. You know what he said? Pass. You've passed the test. You've been acknowledged as righteous. You've been reckoned as uh, someone that fears the Lord, and you've passed. And then when God passes me, I'm not interested in that award anymore. I'm just sitting there. But as the principal was calling out the name of the recipient, my name was called. So I was like, oh my goodness, I went up. The principal actually gave me the word. He actually gave me the scholarship. He gave me the microphone. I don't know why he gave me the microphone that day. He probably saw me getting beat up by my, you know, you know, Sunday and all these people. So say something. So I took the microphone. What do you say times like that? There's only one desire I had. I had. That is to lift up the name of God. So I said, I'm going to sing. And the principal goes, okay. <laughs> he sat down. What do you do? You hold on to the word, and you're holding on to the microphone. This is a song that I sang. It was pretty, it was, it was my honest confession of my desire to God. I said, to the, I, said I confessed to God on that day as I was standing before the parents, teachers, and the students. I said to them, I, I sang to God. I said, in moments like this, I sing out a song. You know that song? In moments like this, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like this, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I kept on singing it for, for about five minutes. But because um, it was just not enough. So after the five minutes, I had to finish, but I finished, but it was still not enough, so I had sang another song in medley. (laughs) (laughs) The name of the song is, Thank You, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your love to me. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace so free. I lift up my eyes, I lift up my voice, and praise you over and over again. You are my everything. You are my Lord. I lift up my hands, I sang and crying, <laughs> praying like that, praising like that. When I was about to finish, I was actually afraid because my principal is an atheist. I was afraid that my principal would say, come down off the stage. But I was thinking, whatever, <laughs> praising and praising. I, lift, I opened my eyes, guess what? Students and teachers are actually crying. So what's going on? I came down from the stage. I still remember to this day, my ninth grade years, um, homeroom teacher, Mrs. Nelson, she came up to me. She embraced me, and this is what she said. Thank you. Thank you. And I didn't know. I was like, oh, why? And she, this is what she said. She says, you know, a year ago, beginning of this school year, do you remember the letter that you sent us? Come out, all the hiding Christians. Let us fear the Lord. Do you remember that? I was like, yeah. And she goes, you know, when I took that letter, I went home and I cried. Because for the last 20 years living in Japan, where there is 8 million gods, I've been hiding myself that I'm a Christian. But on that day, it was so difficult for me to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, now you persecute me. It was so difficult for me to do that. But wouldn't you say that I, as a Christian, wouldn't I want to serve the Lord like that too? Wouldn't I want to tell people that I love the Lord too? And I said... Yeah, and she said, thank you for doing that on our behalf. And all, all my friends were saying, you know what, thank you so much. And my friends were saying, yeah, me too. In fact, the guy that, I, that was persecuting me in school the most, he's like, I'm a Christian too. <laughs> Turns out he's a pastor's kid. 
I was like, okay. You know what? Until Goliath went down, until Goliath fell to the ground, the entire Israelites were hiding in their places. But when there is David that comes out of nowhere, he has only one thing on his mind. Do you remember the time, if you read the Bible, this is a, probably the most dramatic event that happened in, in the history of mankind. Little David, he has only one thing on his mind. I will not let anyone disgrace the name of God. And he stood up, going against a Gentile, going, against, going up against a giant. He probably heard of this sound. When everybody else is yelling at him, Goliath, you know, yelling at him and, you know, ridiculing him, I, I still think David was able to hear something like this. God was standing up from his throne and he was putting his hands together for David. And when, the, when Goliath went down, all the hiding Israelites stood up for the kingdom of God. In your families, in your, in your workplace, in your campus, people are hiding because they're afraid of the world. But if you stand up as the worshiper of God, fearing God on their behalf, worshiping God on their behalf, being God conscious on their behalf, and if you're living every moment of your life God-centered, honoring God because of God, if you're driven by the glory of God and people see that, they'll come back to the Lord. Do the work of an evangelist. Time has come, so I'm going to wrap it up. Number four, quickly, repeat after me. Fulfill your ministry. Brothers and sisters, there's so much more to do in this world. If you don't do it, nobody's going to be able to do it. The time has come that it's your time for you to do. Finish up the ministry. Lastly, the crown. What do I do? What's the fate? This is the world. This is a Christian. Now, in this world, if I live as a Christian, fulfilling the ministry, enduring suffering, discerning and being sober-minded and doing, doing the work of evangelists, what's my fate? Let's read verses, verses uh, 7 and 8. Let's read this together. Verse 7 and 8, the crown. Let's read this together. 7 and 8, ready? Go. Amen. You know, what's my fate? The starts with a C. Crown. If you fight the good fight, if you run the race, finish up the race, and if you keep your faith, let me spell that out for you. Doing the work of an evangelist, being sober-minded as you live this day and age, enduring sufferings until the end, and if you keep your faith, and if you fulfill your ministry, God will award to you on that day uh, the crown of righteousness. But there's one problem. You know what that problem is? There is not a single person who's going to be able to keep that faith until the, until the last stage. Because everybody is so concerned about their own lives. Aren't you? You guys are still concerned about what, I'm gonna, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What am I going to do in the future? People still worry about what does God want to talk to me about? Me, 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 me. Everybody's still God-centered. Me-centered, isn't it? People don't take heed to the Word of God. So there is not a single person who's going to be able to receive the crown of righteousness in here. That's why this is a good news. You cannot do it. But behold the author and the perfecter of our faith. And what do you see? 2,000 years ago, Jesus probably had a conversation. This is my just guess. Had a conversation with God, the Father. He says, Father doesn't look like there's anyone in here that's going to be able to receive the crown of righteousness. I have to go. So Jesus takes off his crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness. He takes it off. He leaves it on the throne. He did not consider himself in equality with God, but he emptied himself. He took the form of man. He took the likeness of a servant. He came down to this earth. And he carried the cross. As he was carrying the cross, instead of wearing the crown of righteousness, which he deserves, only he deserves, on his head, the crown of thorns were placed. In that instant moment, something eternal 
happened. Something spiritual happened. You know what that is? There's a swap. There's a swap. That's the day, the day that Jesus Christ wore the crown, crown of thorns was the day, was the very moment the crown of righteousness was promised to us. The day that Jesus Christ was cast out from the city of Jerusalem, that's the day we were brought into the family of God. The day that Jesus Christ was struck down by the justice, justice of God, that's the day that the living water that doesn't ever dry started to erupt and started to well up in our hearts. If you behold him, what do you see? You see one thing, who deserves our all. You see one thing, and that is someone that, you, that deserves your love, that deserves your life. If you're busy loving him, you will be able to fight the good fight, finish up the race, and you're going to be able to keep